And we're live. Welcome to Music Batters with Jason Tram. Thank you for joining us for our unique podcast community. We're so excited you can join us. Please remember to subscribe to us on YouTube and to follow us on social media. You can see this show live on YouTube, on Facebook Live, on LinkedIn Live. Also now you can find us on our, our new places on our podcast hosts like Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify Podcasts. So thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Music Matters with Jason Tram. We have a wonderful show for you. I'd like to welcome my guest, Gord, Dr. Gordon Turk. Thank and um, he's the first of our guests to be on for the second time. So it's great to have you back, Gordon, and um, welcome. Thank you. Just call me Rerun. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to have you back. And uh, we've, got, we've worked together for 15 years now here at Ocean Grove. And um, it's been some of the most interesting times of my life to watch you play and to, to learn about Ocean Grove. And to we've explored such great repertoire together over the years. We have, but we have this great symbiotic relationship, working relationship in that to be able to be doing what we do normally what's expected of us to do choir work, Sunday services work, but to have this whole other dimension of working with orchestras and all kinds of instruments, and then having this magnificent organ, which plays under its own steam, as it were, for the concerts and organ recitals, but to do this joint thing where we've explored so much repertoire that other people only read about in books and we've actually performed it here and in the auditorium uh, with you always assemble wonderful players for the orchestra. It's, oh, it's so exciting to bring group. and the players love to come down here. Yeah, first of all, Ocean Grove is such a special place. So for those who may not know about Ocean Grove, New Jersey, uh, you've been here for a few years. Tell us about um, what Ocean Grove is and um, give us the background and like what, what music has been like here in your tenure. Well, it's a very small community. It's only about a mile square, but it was founded in 1869 as a religious retreat and as a retreat for body, mind, and spirit, and by Methodists back in the 1860s. So uh, they chose this spot because it, it was uninhabited when they first came here, and there seemed to be no mosquitoes. So that was a great plus. I love that story they how they, they, they scouted Cape May, but Cape May, they got eaten alive when they were camping, <laughs> and they said, no way, keep it. <laughs> That's right. And, so it's it's kind of a phenomena of the area area and even today there are a few mosquitoes around but they're not the kind that attack and um, eat you alive uh, it's it's quite seldom actually that you see any here we see a lot of lightning bugs which is nice in the summer pleasant yeah but um, from the very beginning music was always a part of first of all the Methodist tradition and they were Methodists who founded this place. And it's always been a tradition of the Christian church. So uh, it's a significant part of worship, of daily life, of expression. And we've had many famous musicians who have been here over the past 150 years. And not only performers, but people, your predecessors, uh, going way back to Talies Morgan, who was an impresario, who was the first person, I think, to really start bringing opera singers from New York here. And, and boy, he brought and, uh, Enrico Caruso and John McCorbick and Galli Kurt and Lawrence Kurt, Tibbet and Madame Schumannheit, <laughs> uh, and just so many incredible singers who were here. And the people came to hear them. Uh, there were also famous song leaders for church singing, and they uh, just had music as part of their lives. So it's the music, education, recreation, have all been a part of the faith experience here in Ocean Grove, and i um, very happy for it. There are other sister organizations too, in what they call the Chautauqua Circuit. Uh, conference of other schools. One, the most significant one being Chautauqua, New York. And that's of a similar age as Ocean Grove. Uh, but maybe we might be two or three years older than Chautauqua, New York. But uh, there again, music is a very, very uh, strong force, uh, maybe even a dominating force there. Um, and here we have the opportunity to hear so much wonderful music and 
people are involved in music, not only in worship, but throughout the uh, children's program where they're doing musicals and also with the uh, professional singers that we have in residence here and the instrument that we have, which is of world renown, uh, being one of the largest organs of the world. And People always so ask me how many pipes, what's the count if you had to guess? It's just a few below 13,000. It's 12,800 and something or other. <laughs> People think uh, so, that you always have that like somewhere handy that you like, know the pipe numbers. And, so, uh, <laughs> and it has grown from being a really modest size instrument. When I first started here, it had about 1,400 pipes. and Only 1,400 so, pipes? Yeah, which was a pretty modest For size a, instrument. 6,500 seat uh, auditorium. <laughs> but those pipes were built individually. Each pipe was a very large scale and they had very high wind pressure behind them to blow them hard to make it produce a lot of sound in a big space. And so it was. he was an eccentric, the organ builder, who came from England, Robert Hope Jones. And he got the contract here in 1907. And he said, I can build one of the world's largest organs. Well, it turned out it was an organ that was one of the largest sounds. It was evidently oh, okay. powerful. And there were a couple of sets of pipes in it that unfortunately no longer exist. They disappeared somewhere in the 1950s or 60s that were so powerful that they said that the lake, which is not far from here, uh, from not far from where we are sitting right now, uh, a few hundred feet, that um, the water would ripple on the lake when these particular stops were played in the auditorium. Uh, on the auditorium organ. But today, the, uh, the instrument is much more versatile and it's brought into a kind of uh, musical personality that's versatile for concertizing, for organ literature, for playing for church, for accompanying uh, other instruments, for accompanying voices, for accompanying choirs, which is certainly a large part of what we do here. And so the instrument has a very versatile and musical personality. It's truly a treasure. I mean, um, early on in my, my tenure here, we did the 100th birthday of the organ. It was on right. uh, Pipe Dreams, and we did that incredible program. And it's pretty amazing to hear the, the journey this instrument's taken. And um, it must be really special being uh, for you having to been part of that journey and to help transform the organ to the, the marvel that it is today. Yes, um, we have sort of grown up together, the organ I, in a sense. And it's, it also has a unique situation in that the organ functions only in the summertime and the building is open only in the summertime. It is not a winter, winterized building. So if we were here in November, December, we'd be sitting with our coats and jackets on, trying to play a violin or something with hands that were freezing uh, because it's very cold. So as a result, the organ is placed in hibernation, in effect. Uh, People it, ask me that all the time. How, does it damage the organ? Does it damage the pipes? Not really, because they, we just let it go to sleep. The temperature goes way, way down. But um, we have done a lot to be sure that it's protected from moisture and from outside weather influence. And the air is very clear here, being so close to the ocean. So there's cleanness in the air, and that has helped to protect the and give longevity to the organ. All of the inward parts, the mechanical parts that you can't see, uh, things, pieces of wood and metal and leather, lots of little le pieces of leather that are incorporated in it. Uh, that has just given a much longer lifespan to the leathers and to the whole working mechanism of the organ. When you read about Bach, you know, there were some letters that so sometimes the, 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 the mice would eat through the leather and through right. the organs. <laughs> they would. So, and we have actually had that happen here. Have we really? <laughs> once or twice, yeah. We found little holes gnawed in things that um, we knew uh, that they were not uh, hungry organ tuners, that they were little animals. And have we? Are there any other organs that you know of this of this size or this kind of uh, grandeur that, that 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 do what we do? That hibernate in the winter, and I don't think another one exists. I know of one other uh, instrument 
that historically, it's a very, very small instrument by comparison. Um, in, call, in Round Lake, New York, it's a very historic organ, I think from the 1860s or 70s, wow. and it uh, does not fare very well over the years. It's not as protected as our instrument is, and it's a very old instrument that has remained a very old instrument that hasn't had the same opportunity for loving care as ours has. Uh, but it sits there freezing during the winter. And I love the story about the console, how it came from, it was originally the Longwood Gardens console, right? Yes, it was, and back in the 20s, and the 1920s. Uh, now we're talking about 100 years ago. <laughs> so uh, that's an interesting point. I hadn't stopped to think about it. The current organ console that we have is, at this point, uh, about 100 years old. But the, all of the me, internal mechanisms of the console are now solid state. But the exterior wood is all black walnut, beautiful wood. And the interior surfaces are of mahogany. And the bench and all the wood, uh, all of those things are um, of walnut and beautiful wood. But we obtained the organ console back in the 1980s. And John Shaw, the curator, spent five years rebuilding it. Then we brought wow. it here. And uh, we had found it in it where it was just been stashed away in an old warehouse and in a very um, unsatisfactory place. So rain was coming into the place. Oh. But uh, fortunately, we were able to get it and then started the long restoration process of it. The current keyboards that are in it are fairly new. They were built in the 19... Uh, let's see, around two, year 2000. And they were built in England <laughs> and shipped over here. And the uh, pedal board also was built. So in a sense, we, we have five keyboards and we also have a pedal board. So in a sense, we have six keyboards. Uh, to, and it was an interesting uh, little aside that because of our Summer Stars program that we had last week, we had two pianists playing, two each one playing a Steinway Grand. So these two pianos were brought in for the concert. They were on the stage, plus another Grand, a Kanabi Grand that we have on the console, uh, that we have on the platform. Plus we have organ, the organ has five keyboards and the pedal boards. And I thought, boy, it would be fun if we could find, let's see, one, two, three, uh, three and five or eight, one and nine, nine people to come and do some kind of a jamming session on all these keyboards. That would be fun, yeah. That would be fun. Uh, I mean, it's such a, such a spectacular instrument, and um, you have such li like almost limitless combinations of colors and, and to draw on, and um, to watch you perform on the instrument I've been watching now for 15 years, uh, preludes, postludes, and com major concerts, it's just amazing to me how well you know the instrument. I mean, um, it, it's it's truly like organic to you like you know well it is uh, what I started to say was because a while ago where I was going was that uh, because the organ is in hibernation during the winter that's time that we can do some mechanical work but that's also time that we have to do our creative thinking about the instrument so that we can do most of our physical mechanical work in the spring when things start to warm up but then the instrument plays during the summer so there's been a lot of time to actually think about the projects and what we're doing in terms of restoration or enlargement of the instrument. We have many, many, many sets of pipes in this that are historic. And we have many, we have hundreds of thousands of pipes that were built new for this room. But we also have hundreds and hundreds of pipes that are vintage pipes that we have specifically looked and sought out by builders uh, the most one of the most famous was Ernest Skinner and a builder of the 1920s and 30s one of the great American builders and another company called the Kimball Organ Company which um, was one that built had a very distinguished reputation and uh, they 
from about 100 years ago. Our oldest, the oldest pipes in the organ actually come from an older organ yet. There are two sets of pipes that come from an organ that was from 1872. Wow. And they're two of my favorite stops. They're now playing on modern, they stand on modern wind chests so that the air that blows through them is directed through a more modern wind system. But they're the same pipes that they were in 1872 they were playing in a church in Philadelphia, and now they've, they've been here for years. And so we, we've had this conversation before. I'm always fascinated by music history and the, by the history of instruments. The organ goes back such a long way, um, and it wasn't like before the organ, the harp was an instrument of the church, and before that there was, uh, it was a cappella singing at the very beginning. Yes. But tell us about um, how long can pipes last, and how far back do they go, surviving pipes? Well, they can go back for years, they'll go on forever unless there is some uh, physical act against them. Because they're a composite of an alloy of mostly tin and lead. The higher the tin content, the brighter the sound is going to be. The higher the lead content, the mellower, perhaps darker and mellower the mm. sound will be. And then when you get to large pipes, they add a certain percentage of zinc to give strength for the tallest pipes. Now tell us about the tallest pipes in the great auditorium organ, the diaphone well, pipes that everyone's The diaphones, loves. there are three sets that are pipes, the lowest of which is 32 feet tall. And then each note that it goes a little higher it gets is a few inches shorter. shorter. Uh, and we have two sets that are made of wood one set is called the diaphones and it produces an enormous amount of fundamental that you can feel pulsating and shaking and vibrating you feel through your whole body <laughs> yes and then uh, one is called a trombone and it's an octave lower than a tuba which is really really low uh, only low c is uh, I think it's 32 cycles of sound per second. It's almost inaudible. It's almost so, just at the edge but, of human perceptibility. Yeah, but <laughs> boy, these, but the trombone and another one called a bombard, which is made of metal, they're certainly audible. They sound like um, a raft of helicopters flying through. They, <laughs> by themselves, they sound very strange, but they're very percussive. But in the total picture of the sound, in the total ensemble, then they add d tremendous drama. It's like having a whole raft of timpani players at your disposal uh, there. So being there. a concert organist, you've played organs around the world. Where are some of the organs that you would say, like some of the top five organs you've played and uh, what makes them so unique? And when you go to a new organ, you have a concert on it, how do you get comfortable with all the stops and the choices that you have to play with? I make sure that I have at least three full days of practice on any organ, and that's uninterrupted practice um, that I can. For those of you who don't know, Dr. Turk spends you know probably four hours a day, something like that, almost every day on the organ. Normally, uh, in this here in the summer, I it, I spend more time because I have two concerts a day, so it's I'm spending five to six to sometimes seven hours a day. And when I go away somewhere to do a concert where I know I have that prescribed time that's available to me, I'm practicing all day. Um, you know the day of a concert, you back off a little bit. But for the days leading up to the concert, I'm a workhorse. And before I even go to the concert, I want a written description of the organ. Hmm. And so I have and any verbal feedback I can get from the organist of the location or from any uh, people who've played it. So, and every, each organ is entirely different from every other organ. They're, each one is custom built, and so they all have the personality. This is like having a, a singers. Y you may have 50 sopranos and 50 tenors, but each one is going to have a different tone quality. And so you have to get to know that personality and be able to work with it. Uh, some of my favorite instruments or favorite venues for playing uh, or memorable ones have been in the US and some have been in Europe, um, Russia and Japan. The one in Japan that I especially liked, um, there's a, a large, magnificent organ in the city of Kyoto uh, in the concert hall there, which, place, which is a very state-of-the-art hall 
and a magnificent organ. And then in another small city, um, which strangely enough is called Sun City, uh, it's a suburb of, a, uh, of an area called Ashia. Uh, there is a beautiful instrument. It's one of my favorite organs. Um, it's not a big, big, big instrument, but it's in, set in magnificent acoustics. And it was built in Belgium. So that's an instrument that I especially like. And uh, playing at St. Petersburg, Russia, was one of the most interesting experiences because I was playing at the Bolshoi Philharmonic. Oh, wow. And I knew that here I was playing in the hall where Tchaikovsky and Prokofiev and Rachmaninoff and you name it. Striking. They they were all there conducting, playing, composing. And when I, I practiced rehearsed for three days and I had to rehearse at night there that was the only time Mm. that the hall was available they had their concerts every night at about six o'clock and the concerts would be over by 8 30 and I was permitted to begin rehearsing at nine I could practice from nine until midnight really and I couldn't practice during the day because the hall was in use for things so I did that for a series of nights and then when I was backstage waiting to go out um, I don't, don't speak Russian except to say thank you and yes and no and thank you. Um, then I was going out on the stage and I thought, gosh, I'm going to walk out on this stage and either fall in a dead faint or else have a wonderful time. And I just thought, boy, here was Rachmaninoff and, and you, any of the wonderful performers and composers you can think of, this is their home turf and I'm here with them sacred and ground for Russian musicians so the another thing that was it, so I had a good time and uh, one thing that was helpful was that there was a kind of tradition that connected with the St. Petersburg and the conservatory and the people of the Philharmonic with the Curtis Institute there was oh. a tradition that carried across there of teachers and performers going from one to the other and I thought that's a good thing so, Isn't it amazing how musical uh, music can bridge all the political divides, especially oh, Russian and American? Yes. Over even in the middle of the Cold War, we've had so much culture in, interchange with Russia. We always had. Yes, and you think of going back to Van Cliburn going and playing at the Moscow and uh, competition, and uh, that was in the 1950s. Khrushchev was banging his shoe on the gavel, yeah. <laughs> uh, shoe on the uh, lectern at the. Uh, in New York City at the United Nations and all that stuff going on but the music carried through and he could go as an American then win that competition there in a place that was when we were involved in such an intense Cold War so music bridged the gap I have so many musical colleagues who I work with, you know, in the opera world, certainly, and in the symphonic world. And, um, you know, the second we, the second we, go, I go to another country and we start making music, all the political stuff fades away. It's like we go yeah. to the restaurant together after we talk music and, you know, we, all those divides kind of heal up. And it's, uh, it just reminds me like, oh, yeah, there's a, so, so much more than just the, the divisiveness and the struggles that we face. There's, there's, there's that common humanity that we can always find if we look hard enough. Because it lifts you above just the ordinary uh, aspects of life, and it, it transports people, but it gives them an opportunity to uh, find ways of express, ex- expression that's greater than just language itself, as wonderful as that is. Um, but sometimes that has its limits, and you reach those limits, but the music can go beyond that. What did you play in Russia? I played the Poulenc Concerto for one thing. It's one of the most divine pieces. And it's unique, was wonderful. Unique, idiomatic, strange, um, and beautiful. I played that not in St. Petersburg. In St. Petersburg, I played an organ recital. And I was playing Bach and César Franck and Vidor. And I did a Poulenc um, encore, a hmm. piece that I had transcribed, a waltz for the organ, and, uh, they, and some other Baroque things. Then I played in a city that was an overnight train ride and it was a long journey. I can't remember the name of the city and it was, um, oh, I take it back. That wasn't in Russia, that was in Ukraine. Um, Everything I said about Russia was accurate. 
It's just that when I played the Poulenc concerto, it was in Ukraine, and there was not an interpreter present, present and I didn't speak Russian or Ukraine, <laughs> and the conductor didn't speak, no one spoke English. And here I was in this very, very re remote, large city, but remote uh, area, without an interpreter. However, music did the whole, did bridge the gap again. And we did the Poulenc concerto, and they had never before heard or performed the Poulenc. Wow. We had gotten the scores and got them to them, so they were ready for the performance. We had a wonderful time rehearsing it, and in performance, it was very exciting. And there were, one way we communicated was that the timpanist could speak German, and I could speak enough German that he and I could communicate, and then he would translate into the uh, language of the Ukraine. And we had one dramatic moment at the end of the uh, Poulenc, where there's that beautiful viola solo, solo sure. just for the end. And the organ is playing, you come off the bombast and the big things, and it comes down to this very intimate, gentle sound for about eight measures, and it's, it's fortunately it's fairly slow. Just as we got there, I saw all this consternation and activity and looking around and movement in the string division, and I, and her, the, principal violist who was responsible for the viola solo, a string popped on her instrument. <laughs> so she panicked and everybody was just sort of panicking and they were looking and she was trying to fix and they couldn't fix the thing. In the meantime, I'm sitting there playing and I could see that this was happening and the conductor looked like a deer in headlights. He, did, he, he was frightened, what's gonna happen? But I looked at him and I just nodded and I looked, and then I saw them passing another viola yeah. down. Up, the, up from the back desk. And up from, <laughs> yes, and they got it in place, and the last measure that I played, I just put in a nice retard <laughs> and watched the conductor, and down came the baton, and in came the viola. Isn't it great how we never forget these like stories of like, some of the performances? <laughs> I, I, have, I have the same I have the same kind of stories. You, you remember like all these crazy things that happened backstage. That's what makes live music so interesting. It does. Well, afterwards, uh, they were all lined up sitting out in the, uh, in the backstage area, and they were all uh, just chatting and talking, relaxing. And then they, they saw me, and the violist came over, and she, the only thing she could say in English was, Thank you. <laughs> That's all you need to know. <laughs> so, We've got some yeah, shout out to shout out some people online here. We've got John Bryson who grew up attending Thornley Chapel and loves Ocean Grove and is on the show today. We also have um, Greg uh, Greg Owen says hello. Greg, he's watching hello, as well, Greg. and yes. he's uh, known you since you started in 1974. Yes, and as a matter of <laughs> fact, Greg's brother was here at the auditorium service about two weeks ago. And he said, I'll bring you greetings from Greg. So right back to It's a to small Greg. world. There it's it a small is. world out there. After and I, I tell everyone, um, everyone uh, who I meet doesn't know Ocean Grove. We all have a connection to Ocean Grove. It's like the seven degrees of separation. It's, you find right. someone someone who, someone who has a house down here or comes to the concerts or it's just a very small world. Yeah. I get a lot of, my, my mother used to sing in the choir. My grandmother used to sing in the choir back in the 19 whatevers. And uh, it's just interesting. Yeah. It's well, I got one just two days ago and I was, I don't remember where I was, but I was not in Ocean Grove. And a person said, oh, my grandmother has a house in Ocean Grove. And it was a, it was a young person, so it was the first connection that she had made outside her grandmother's uh, living here. Well, listen, let's talk a little bit about this program we're going to do. Absolutely. Okay. Very exciting. So tell us about the Summer Stars Classical Music Series. And uh, I've got a special announcement to those of you who are watching online and uh, before or after. Um, so, Gordon, tell us about the Summer Stars Classical Music Series. And you founded that. Is that correct? The whole series? Right. Yes. And this is a series of classical music and primarily instrumental uh, because we have a lot of vocal music in our in our larger program here in Ocean Grove. I wanted to do something that would really highlight instruments of the orchestra um, and in all of the possible uh, groupings that we can, usually small groups. And we always have one, so we have concerts in July, five Sundays in July. It turns out quite often that the, the last one is the first, third, not Sundays, they're Thursdays, five Thursdays in July 
or the first Thursday in August. There are five of them. And our last concert, where we have the great fortune of being able to have an, a full orchestra for our closing, uh, our finale each year. And that's something that we have shared um, at, that's been a great experience for both of us. Uh, from the organ bench and from the conductor's podium and all the people in between uh, where we all come together and we uh, make music in a big way and we are all extensions of the auditorium which is a magnificent room acoustically it's shaped if you look at it a little bit like a gigantic cello um, it is and or a tortoiseshell with cello I like or that or tortoiseshell <laughs> or a cello or an arc um, upside down or something and it's uh, well you know the word nave n-a-v-e which refers to the long part the part in a church where a congregation sits in a traditional church building is referred to as a nave and it comes from the historical thing of naval um, and from navy uh, because if you look at it it looks like a boat a ship that's upside down the ceilings were built that way usually so that's how they came up with that word, the nave came to pertain to that spot. But coming back to the auditorium, the shape of the building is such that it, it enhances music and it's made of wood. And that huge suspended uh, ceiling of all tongue and groove wood um, it just reflects and reverberates and it makes reacts. everything sound better. Yes. It, it just gives it color and warmth. and, uh, and There's such clarity and just such warm and beautiful. It's not to be believed. I mean, to, to hear classical music in there or hear any music in there is just so beautiful. Whether it's a string quartet, it, you wouldn't think that you'd go to hear an unamplified string quartet in a 6,000 seat venue, but it works just as beautiful hearing our like, large choir festival with a larger choir or hearing a small intimate group as well. Yes, uh, it's because the acoustics work and uh, it's also because the audiences are listening to what's going on and uh, you can enjoy it that way. Uh, the fact that we have sliding doors on the sides and as you, on these warm Sunday evenings, that's the air conditioning that we get. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Good. Um, because it's, the building was built in 1894, so it doesn't have air conditioning, but it has sliding doors at the uh, first floor level then there is a balcony that is on three sides, a horseshoe balcony, and there are pocket doors up there that slide open. So a lot of air can just circulate in the room. And so outside noises become a little bit of the part of the, the total experience. You're listening to a, a string quartet of uh, Beethoven and um, you hear the sound maybe of a child's voice um, or a perambulator, somebody pushing a baby stroller going by, or you hear a crow out there going, call, call. Uh, I, I was listening like to one of the things we recorded. I forget what it was. It was a quiet moment, and then I heard a, um, I heard crickets in the background. I'm like, that is so beautiful. Like it was such a nice part of the soundtrack. I'm like that's so interesting. Like it really is pleasant and, and uh, totally different. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it has. There's a kind of informality about it, uh, but it's also part of the genuine home quality of it uh, you know it's not it's not a uh, uh, antiseptic sound it's not a studio where you're isolated from the world uh, it's a sound where you're we're in the world and uh, it's around us and uh, surrounds us and uh, it's a part of it so what year did you found the series and what what what, um, what prompted you to start this summer, the summer stars the wonderful acoustics of the room and I knew that we hear a lot of choral music a lot of vocal music and I thought I think there will be an audience for people hearing instrumental piano of course but hearing uh, all the stringed instruments either individually or in ensemble and wind instruments of course brass and then we finally were fortunate enough to be able to incorporate a an orchestra itself and that has become more and more a um, had more finesse and more definition and precision and uh, particularly since you've been conducting it and uh, these signs and have just 
uh, brought it to a point of high definition and well, it's so exciting to put together some of the programs we've done the organ pieces we've done are truly some of the most interesting repertoire um, some of the American composers some of the the some of these contrary are, are almost unheard of I, right. even the rental parts you could tell they haven't been played since you know <laughs> many years the, the <laughs> first time that we did the Horatio Parker concerto uh, we had we rented the parts and it came from a library that I think was in Boston and would they they were surprised when they pulled it out of the stacks <laughs> they said you're the first person to rent this in something like 80 years or something <laughs> and it it's become one of my favorite works it's for stunning organ and orchestra. It's absolutely stunning so, yeah it's wild and romantic and kind of and and we've gotten people you know, people you can find it on YouTube just type in Dr. Turk's name and you'll find it and it's really it gets a lot of listens and people really enjoy it and it's a repertoire you're not going to hear very often my favorite part of it is that second it's it's the second part of the opening movement and it's longer than the opening part itself but it, they don't call it a second movement uh, and that there is the most wonderful uh, collaboration between the organ a very 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 soft and ethereal violin solo harp organ violin harp and French, French horn. horn that's right and it's it's right out of Richard Strauss um, it's it's Mahler it's Strauss it's Wagner it's, it's just so beautiful in an American lens it's got a wild mix mm-hmm I don't think he gets the uh, the recognition that he probably deserves. I think. Uh, Funny thing is that uh, his music. He was the teacher of Charles Ives. Everyone knows that it's in the textbooks that he was yes. kind of a pedantic type of person. And they all considered he taught composition at Yale University. He was organist out of a church in New York City, and uh, at a couple of different churches at different times. But he was always considered to be uh, pedantic and and um, just conventional and nothing. And Charles Ives, of course, was the the, exact the rebel opposite. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and uh, so he he didn't have any time for him, even though it was his teacher. And they went very opposite paths. And as it turned out, Charles Ives became the darling of modern music, or one of the darlings of modern music. And no one knows of, of Horatio Parker except um, Jason Tram and Gordon Turk and a few others. Well, I now, think people have dis- started to discover it because so, that recording has, has over 1,600 views. People watch it, and we got some wonderful comments from people who said, this music deserves to be heard. There's something really special there. Yeah. I, I agree. It was, it's exciting. It's visceral, especially in a place like this where you have uh, – it's so interesting to have an instrument like this in a, in a, in a wooden building. Mm-hmm. Right, you, you'd think of a large organ like this in a stone church often. Right, so it has a very different impact right off the bat because of that acoustical difference, mm-hmm. and it's designed really for spoken. This hall is designed for spoken word, for oratory and preaching, and also for music, and not uh, the sound that you're going to hear in a stone building. So the organ is designed to function and to um, sound its best in this wooden building, and it's a different kind of expression. The same as if you took a tenor, a bass, or a soprano, and you're singing in a big stone building with a cavernous sound with a lot of reverberation, and then you bring them into a concert hall, which will have a more intimate kind of Quicker acoustic. Quicker decay. Yep. Yes, and less... Um, less acoustical decay, then you hear it in a different way, and that's so. There is music that's appropriate to each. Um, other composers that we've had here are from the French school, of course, um, Alexander Guimont and um, uh, Charles Marie Vidor, and then the great French and symphonists, certainly Poulenc. And then the greatest of all, Camille Saint-Saëns, the symphony number no. three. I think that's one of the greatest symphonies ever written. It's, it's just... That was his farewell to classical music, to one of the greatest minds. You know, the more I study Saint-Saëns, the more I think he's one of the greatest musical minds. He's one of the absolute geniuses. His, some of his chamber music is astounding. His tone poems never get performed, and I think they're stunning. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, he was quite... A, quite a genius and a very special musical personality. 
we are, we've also done some, and then Poulenc, the, more, the most contemporary, and one of the most beautifully crafted pieces written for organ and orchestra. And then the biggest one of all, uh, the biggest concerto for that combination is the Jongen, the Belgian composer. We opened the show with the final move, with the uh, the Takata. Nice. And <laughs> is that's... not very subtle. I call it an organ brass cage match. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, caged rage, I think, and or caged lion. It's it's wonderful. That. But this the uh, third movement is my favorite. Uh, it's so serene and very Debussy-esque. Uh, it's so beautiful. I'm like Respighi, Strauss together. It's kind of all this of wild kind of. There's a lot of French influences with those augmented chords all over it. And all these whole tone scales yeah. uh, and things that were so much a part of impressionism. And then we did the Howard Hansen concerto. Oh, I forgot which, about that one. Yeah, that's, that's a great which piece. Which is a really interesting piece, written in the 1940s and very American. As a matter of fact, it sounds almost like movie, film a score, movie sure. score. Film score. And uh, it's, so it has, uh, brings a new and a different character to it. Now we've taken mm -hmm. a different tack this year. We have a different type of program. Tell us about this program and um, you're, you've got a concerto on this program. Tell us what this, we're doing this year. Well, the, the program, first of all, is going to be a kind of birthday bash for to celebrate the the uh, music of Beethoven, I mean, it, one of the monuments of of all composition. If there was a Mount Rushmore statue, we would have Bach, Beethoven, <laughs> and Mozart certainly. And I'd like to see Brahms. Brahms. Up I was going to say Brahms too. too. Yeah, um, <laughs> up there. And there are others who would be worthy of it as well. But those in particular, Beethoven was such an incredible personality as well as his music. And it's all reflected in his music. He was very good friends with Goethe, and the poet and um, philosopher, and uh, he was very um, much involved in, in philosophy. I think uh, he had so many inward struggles. And of course, as he grew older, uh, and he had experienced deafness, that just became such a tragic. Yeah, Beethoven. Uh, when you read his Heiligenstadt Stop, Testament, yes. yeah, that was the beginning of it. He was he was in he's in the throes of his he's noticing the hearing loss. He's tried to see doctors. You can read he's he's considered suicide, and he kind of worked it out. People don't realize the Heiligenstadt Testament never got released. It never got sent. It was found after he died. It was written to his brothers, mm -hmm. and it's, kind of, it's such an interesting look at Beethoven's kind of inner life, you know, inner inner mind, and how he's how he through his music was able to. Uh, um, what I love is the struggles changed music forever. Beethoven kind of retreated from the world, but he retreated into his music, and his music speaks to us today. So it's an incredibly oh, yeah. poetic thought. It was so sad to remember that one of the the premiere of I don't remember which symphony you might remember which one, it, which he conducted, uh, but at that point the he, ninth, he, the ninth, when he was completely he was deaf, deaf. Yeah, yeah, and he conducted, and at the end. The, um, the people were cheering. They were wild in the feet. He was still going. They even, turned him around. Yes. They had to turn him yeah, around yeah. because he couldn't even even know that. I've always shot. I've always because Beethoven changed everything. He was never happy with his works. He was changing the first symphony towards the end of his life. I mean, he was always editing edits. He, right. He did. You look at Mozart's sketch music, after and sketch. it was perfection every time. His his manuscripts are perfect, flawless. It's like he wrote it down. Like you can't even copy it that best. But Beethoven was a, his music is horribly sloppy. It's got pasted over, and his coffee spilled on some of them. It's like wild, uh, and that reflects a lot of aspects of his life. He was constantly having to move from one place to another place. He had this nephew that he had to take care of, um, who was an orphan, I guess, at that point, and who was such a trial to him. And then there's, there are these wonderful little things, such as the immortal beloved, uh, and that. There's someone with whom he, he was obviously very much in love, and they, historians have never been able to figure out they, exactly. They, they, they have it narrowed down to two. They have it. And it's been right. narrowed. We argue back and forth over the decades. We had the author Jan Swafford on the show, and Jan's written some great books. Yes. And he was a fantastic guest. And I, I asked him some great questions on Beethoven. He was so so interesting. He I asked him, what's it like? He's written four massive biographies on the great composers. His, his Ives book is seminal. 
but his Beethoven is also spectacular. His Brahms is fabulous. Oh. I love the Brahms. He was such a, a clever and witty man. He's like, I don't progress to be a great author. I'm like, well, you're a pretty good author. <laughs> but he's really a composer. So he's like, I bring a composer's point of view to my writing. Very interesting. So in Beethoven, you know, I'm like, well, how much research did you have to do? He's like, about 10 years of research to do one of those books. I can believe it uh, because they're so uh, written with such depth of understanding of the composer and uh, as well as scholastic uh, material. Uh, I asked him what he would ask Beethoven if he could sit down with him. And he said, he goes, well, I wouldn't ask him a compositional question because he didn't like people messing around in his kitchen. He probably wouldn't have answered it. <laughs> He like you. Know, he's, I would just like to watch him walk around the streets and just see his mannerisms. Yeah, it's a good answer. Oh, well, that is good. So the I remember the first time I was in Europe. I was in uh, when I was in Vienna. I went to one of the houses where he lived there, and uh, his piano was there, and there were signs all over that do not do touch, not and touch. there were <laughs> there were um, cords so you couldn't go near things. But no one was around, and I looked around, and I, was, I thought, I have to. I just have to put my hand on it and just touch it lightly uh, to experience that little connection. Was that in Bonn? Uh, no, it, it was in Vienna. Vienna, okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, one of his pianos is still playable, I believe, because we had um, we had uh, Stefan Müller, the famous pianist, on the show too, and he lives in Vienna, and he's he play he owns um, he owns a piano from that age that he plays on a concert instrument, hmm. and he goes, this isn't one of the Beethoven play, but it would have been one of the same type that Beethoven, like Broadman, Broadwood, Broadwood, Broadwood yeah. yeah, and uh, he was like the sound of it, he she demonstrated, he does it on recording sometimes, so it was like, wow, so interesting. Well, in this program, we're going to celebrate uh, aspects of his composition. Uh, the The main stay of the thing is going to be the Beethoven Fifth, the Symphony Number no. Five. So that's going to be a treat. Um, it's going to be exciting for you conducting it. Well, it's going to be exciting. This for is the my fifth time doing it, so that's even more exciting. So. And because the Fifth Symphony, fifth time, and this year is so special because of what we went through last year. Right. Um, I have not conducted a concert in a year and a half. And it's it's the strangest thing to get back into and get ready for a concert because um, the whole the, the the theme of Beethoven's or the narrative of Beethoven's Symphony Number no. Five is is light over darkness. He goes from C minor all the way to triumphant C major, and he turns the the opening motive into a motive of triumph. And um, that was Beethoven dealing with his adversity. That was the artist the artist triumphant. And after what we all we went through as artists during the COVID period and the, the separation from the audience and and um, all the challenges we face, I think this is the, the perfect way to, to really um, do something special that the audience is gonna love. And I think this will be the first time it's been performed in the auditorium. Really? Uh, certainly uh, the first time in our experiences being here. So I, unless Tali S. And Morgan had it back in the 1890s maybe, um, or 1910. Uh, but it, it's, a, it's something to think about that opening motive of four notes, only two pitches, four notes. Ba, 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 ba. That's not even a motive. That's and like that's a sequence. It's, <laughs> it's not even a motive. <laughs> well, I, I think it becomes motivic, but um, and he uses it again and again. But the power of the rhythm and the pitch come together. But it's there's also something about um, numbers that uh, is a part of it. The, the magic. Um, I never liked algebra. I never liked mathematical Me uh, courses, <laughs> and is, but as uh, so I did what I had to do. I liked geometry better than math because I liked I can visualize shapes and uh, I reacted much better to shapes than I do to um, mathematical algebraic formulas and things. But um, as the older I've gotten, I just have such a profound respect for mathematics because it's in the very fundamentals of all existence and that and I think various people tap into that in a uh, perhaps subconscious way but it, some of them intentionally and some philosophically and some scientifically but mathematics is the basis of all um, material that there is and of the whole creation and the other thing about um, that uh, Beethoven that I think uh, that's a part of his makeup and to think of just those the mathematical 
proportions of ba 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 um, and how everything evolves and everything grows out of that is an impressive thing in itself. And that that alone is like his 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 compositional mastery is still is so modern. Like it's so modern what he did with those pieces. Like from the third symphony to the seventh, and then the ninth. By the time he got to the ninth, he was he broke all the traditions and went his own way and, and paved the. He was basically a romantic composer in everything but name. He, yeah, you know, he was opening the door, and the romantics were, you know, artist as hero and uh, this, you know, they just. And it was during it. that time when the romantic concepts, uh, humanism, and he was very much of a humanist, and romantic concepts, and uh, they acknowledged God and the presence of God, but primarily as a uh, being way up there, far away, who creator of the universe, and uh, that's sort of our relationship is that that happened and in the past, and here we are. Uh, it's basically a human journey from here on. He was part of that period of philosophy and thought and the uh, but one of the persons that he respected so highly and who meant a great to him in music was uh, Handel and he had a, an enormous affinity for the music of Handel he didn't really know the music of Bach um, because Bach was just sort of in um, it was still yet to be discovered by Mendelssohn, bringing yes. it out of the yeah, the shadows. Yeah, and he was still um, in oblivion, uh, or not oblivion, but just um, in the shadows. That's a good way of placing it. And not known yet. But he was able to know the works of Handel. And uh, Handel also started out in Germany. And the uh, was a very different individual from Beethoven. For one thing, Handel became wildly successful uh, as a musician, but he spent most of his life in uh, working life in England, and he, at some time in Italy. But um, even he, he honed his craft in Italy, became the opera composer, then exported that to England and became the, the oratorio the composer. <laughs> And uh, so Beethoven had this great affinity for uh, Beethoven for uh, Handel's music, and uh, a love for it, and respected him as the being sort of the great um, creator of uh, that preceded him. So, with that in mind, we're going to do a work by Handel on the program, and this is where I come in. <laughs> um, that uh, relates to the the connection is Beethoven and Handel, and Handel wrote these wonderful oratorios. Not only did he write Messiah, but he wrote others. Uh, there's Solomon. There's Israel in Egypt. Um, there are Deborah. There's so many. There's Samson. Um, there are so many of them that he wrote that are magnificent in their own way. They're long works, and they actually replaced opera when opera was not allowed to be performed during the season of Lent. So opera was the great social entertainment, and the uh, people went to the opera, they enjoyed being seen at the opera, and they, and they uh, made great heroes of their, uh, for, of their singers. So when the church ruled that it was not permitted to have opera, it was too frivolous to experience during the 40 days of Lent, the, suddenly Handel was one of those who uh, was able to provide them with the stories from the Bible set in an operatic way, but called oratorio. Just take out the costumes and the lights and you're basically it's the same music. Yeah, yes. I love that. <laughs> so they, uh, they did these oratorios and they were as long as operas and they had uh, part one, part two, part three uh, sections. So people would listen to, they would sit through the first part, then there would be a little break for the orchestra, there'd be a break for the audience, maybe they'd run out and buy some oranges um, for something refreshing um, and, uh, or whatever, or talk to their neighbors and et cetera. So they decided to keep things lively and more interesting by providing some background music, some kind of Baroque music uh, during these, these intervals. And so between part one and part two, and again between part two and part three, Handel wrote little concertos 
for organ and orchestra. Now those are the first concertos for organ, right? That's what I've heard someone say. That those are the, the original concertos for organ were those Handel concertos. I think they probably are. I'm trying to think if there are any others that are that He old. invented the genre, I think. Uh, it would seem so, yeah. And uh, he certainly honed it and refined it. And he wrote these things very quickly, the way he did also the oratorios. He was dashing off parts and handing the ink was still wet at, at a rehearsal. They were getting parts that he had copyists working on things. But the same with the concertos. And the, it would be usually for a string orchestra and some woodwinds, oboes and bassoons and, they, and an organ part. And quite often, or most often, he was the organist. He would sit there and play. Well, that was the draw. Is that, he, he is that the conduct. maestro would get up there and you know do his? Uh, they would see a virtuoso play, and they would see his oratorio. It's pretty exciting, London society. And the organs were quite small as a rule, and in the English organs of that time, this is the 18th century. The instruments did not have pedal boards. Huh. That was a rarity, and they but they had beautifully developed manuals usually there were two manual instruments and you could tell pretty much what particular pipes were going to be on, on them from one organ to the other to the other to the other it uh, there was kind of a formula that they followed and so they know what was the kind of Handelian sound that one would have heard on those instruments and most often he was sitting there playing them he would also uh, sometimes improvise aspects of them. Sometimes he'd just write out the bass line and he would improvise everything else and then he'd write it down later. Um, th so there was a, a very f improvisatory freshness to these pieces and he would expect that the organist would add some trills and turns and ornamentation uh, to the things. There was one particular organ that they know uh, did have pedals and so most often these things are per performed without a pedal part. And the pedal part, if it was existed at all, was usually doubling the cello and double bass. Interesting. So uh, most of the organs did not have a pedal board. However, there was one in the city of Lincoln. There was a theater that had an organ which had pedals. And it was the only one in which they have a record that he could have actually had a pedal part for it and played the pedals for it, which he probably did, because he was wonderful, obviously a wonderful keyboard player. You might remember seeing in some uh, books of a picture of the child Handel. Uh, someone did a picture, of a painting, in which he was found playing at night. I think his family, I can't remember what his father's occupation was, do you recall? I don't. Was it a doctor? It, but maybe? it was not music, no, and he music. was not in favor of him being a musician. That seems to be throughout history. That's like, like Tchaikovsky. So, and <laughs> yeah, except Mozart. So, Mozart was like, you're a musician. <laughs> so here, as a young boy, he would go up at night into the attic where there was a harpsichord or a clavichord, and he was playing at night. And there is a painting uh, that I have seen of these people coming upstairs holding a candle think, what's going on in the attic? And here is the child in his nightshirt sitting there, Handel, <laughs> as a child uh, practicing uh, in secret that night. What but do you think Handel would, uh, if Handel could play this instrument, what do you think he would think? I think he'd probably say, um, my, this is large. <laughs> <laughs> do you need all these keys? Do you need all these pipes? <laughs> but for his concertos, no. Uh, but I, I mean, what would Handel do today with, with you know? Handel they, he with, had some of the said. largest instruments of his time. If you look at some of the recording of the performance of the Messiah, he had the he had the, the king's budget. So like the the um, we always think Baroque as being more mod modest. Like mm -hmm. ba the Bach ensembles are very small, for example. But Bach was in Leipzig. There wasn't. It was a church basically. But you go to the the court, and he had the, the entire resources of the King of England behind him. There were some of his performances, like the coronation anthems, massive orchestras on those. Mm -hmm. Probably seventy five, hundred players. Well, then there are also the things that they did with the music for out of doors. Like the uh, water, water music, music sure, where sure. they would have the whole band um, on the barge uh, going down uh, the river and uh, passing the king and his Incredible. whole court. And so, and their, their oboes are one of the interesting things. 
because the oboes at that particular at that time were not the modern the mellow instruments we have today uh, and they called they're them more shawl boys, right they were more and they were very sharp <laughs> and nasal and loud it was actually they were considered outdoor instruments more than they weren't refined enough to be inside so i don't know if at that point they had hot boys which were considered the outdoor version and if they had the oboe de caccia or something like the the mellow mm. oboes um for inside because he he orchestrates with oboes all the time. Oh yeah, that was, it was common orchestration. Yeah, maybe horn sometimes and uh, right. Those, but it's yeah, that those are such bright orchestrations, and uh, I can't wait to do that. Those pieces, it's exciting to do Handel, and it's it's just a breath of fresh air. That music. well, the one that we're going to do is a concerto of one, two, three, four movements. Um, but one movement is only about thirty seconds long, but the other movements are substantial the first one is a very bright one with a dance like wonderful rhythm to it the second one is very serene and very introspective very beautiful and fairly long for that kind of a movement usually there are shorter movements and then the third movement is an organ interlude that's about 30 seconds long then the last movement is in the form of a fugue and it's for the organ and the orchestra so he he understand he handle understands the organ as a contrapuntal instrument for playing fugal or contrapuntal music polyphonic music and he writes this whole thing for the organ and the orchestra in a very contrapuntal way and it um it really sings it has a lot of get up and go it's energy it's gonna be fun i, I love handle's music it just has sparkle it's just so clever um, and I, I, was, I was thinking the other day when we were doing the, uh, we had our choir festival at Ocean Grove and we ended with the Beethoven Mount of Olives. How indebted is that to Handel? Oh, yes. I mean, there's with so much of them. The opening, the, the oh, overture like beginning, ta -dum, ta -dum, with the dotted rhythms. And then as soon as the, the voices come in, they come in in a fugal fashion. Praise the Lord. It really, there's a lot of that. He's channeling his inner Handel, I think. Yeah. <laughs> And um, any time, I thought, was that, was that of a British, um, you know, the, the, the London commissioned the Ninth Symphony. I mean, London loved to have the best musicians in the world. They, the Handel, be, uh, Haydn became a star. You know, he went from being a nice court composer for the Esterhazys to being an international superstar because of the London public. They could, they wanted, they commissioned Beethoven. They said, this is one of the greats. Then Mendelssohn, they commissioned Mendelssohn and absorbed, he wrote so much over there. And they've always had a love of everything, uh, you know, great composers yeah the the english have had a a sense about these composers and the fact that they were from other countries didn't deter them from recognizing this this greatness of that music and to uh, wanting it be performed and wanting to be involved in the performances my goodness there's so many choral societies oh, yeah. in england and one of the famous one was the three cathedrals uh society the chorus um that's not the, exactly the right name. What's it? The, the Three Choirs Festival. Mm. It's been famous in England for years. Centuries. <laughs> and uh, three cathedrals that come together. And uh, they go way back. And they continue to, to sing this music. Uh, it makes it so exciting. But other things we're going to do in that program. Of course, the Beethoven Symphony. But we're going to celebrate a couple of other aspects of, of chamber music and orchestral music and one piece that I'm really delighted that we're able to pre present is a concert aria by Beethoven uh, yes by Beethoven that's his called, only his only concert aria his only concert aria and it is, it is stunning it's written for soprano solos and for orchestra and it's an aria that's about 15 minutes long and it explores the dramatic to the poignant to the uh, the melodic the um, it's it's a wonderful piece, and we have a singer who knows how to sing it, um, Michelle Johnson, a uh, beautiful soprano voice, and she's also a wonderful, beautiful person, and uh, she is going to be performing that, and I'm 
I think that's going to be very exciting. I've never worked, I've never been, I've never conducted with her before, but she's just she's very special. She's really very active, and her career started to take off yes. right before COVID. She had major contracts lined up, and all of us had everything canceled. But uh, but she is right back up there again, and uh, she was on the podcast during the COVID pandemic, and just such a bright and sunny person, and uh, can't wait to make music with her. She's a treasure. Uh, she has a smile that just lights up a room, and her voice just lights. Um, sends light into the music it's just so wonderful and she's a joy to watch as to well because she she's so beautiful in her singing uh, and physically as well as uh, the sound orally she's also going to sing another piece which uh, I can't take credit for finding it but I, I take credit for calling you as soon as I found it. Yes, I, heard it. I, I never but heard of it either. Mendelssohn, Salve Regina. Salve Regina by Mendelssohn. And it's just so beautiful that we have to perform it no matter what the rest of the program was. Um, and uh, so this piece... I think Mendelssohn and Beethoven would have gotten along. I'm sure they were. <laughs> you, you know, there's some interesting... I'm sure that they... Uh, I don't know. Do you really think it would have? There are such They're different so different. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Think, but there are so many things that are simpatico in their music. Uh, they both had elements of classicism in, and they both had elements of the romantic in it. So in that respect, they, um, they I hear I hear the, uh, the pre-Wagner in Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn is light and beautiful and beautiful line. All of a sudden, there's moments of like, oh my, this is anticipating the German romantic school. It's there. It's like he's the, he's the dawn of it. And he mm -hmm. got that from Beethoven. I think he just went a little further with it. And, uh, and Mendelssohn had a great affinity for the music and love for the music of Bach. And in addition to that, he's the person who brought Bach to the awareness of people who hadn't known of Bach for a hundred years. That St. Matthew Passion and performance. That performance. Yep, the so that was, that's still a high, uh, a watermark in all of music history. And it, uh, they would have been very, very different personalities, but uh, it would have been interesting to see how they relate. I think Mendelssohn and Mozart would have been an interesting conversation. The two greatest child geniuses probably of all time. I mean, mm -hmm. Mendelssohn, young Mendelssohn, he wrote, I mean, this is this still shocks me. Whenever I look at the overture to A Midsummer's Night Dream, it's one of the greatest pieces ever written by anybody for orchestra. It's so brilliant and original. We, we look at it, we study it in orchestration classes because it's so original. He wrote it at 17. Yeah. I tell my undergrads, I'm like, no matter how good you are, Mendelssohn wrote the overture to at 17, and, and Mo Mozart was middle-aged by then, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> writing at the highest style. <laughs> yeah, uh, they're just incredible personalities, and you wonder how there can be so few of that high level of evolved spirits and mentality that... Uh, rose above all the difficulties of the life. In Mozart's case, he lived, he just went from paycheck to paycheck, as it were, without having steady paychecks. I, he, he lived in poverty much of the time. There were times when they, the story goes that uh, he and his wife, Costanza, would even put some of the chairs in the fireplace to have to burn just to try to keep warm. Yeah, I love it. Mendelssohn, on the other hand, was very fortunate because he was born into a wealthy family and with all the privileges and the comforts of that. But he was industrious. They were both short lived. They yeah. only lived into their 30s. 36, both. They're in the 30, 36 Club and Gershwin. Mm. I think uh, what a Schubert was 35 or 32 or something like that. Yeah, an incredible. Yes. It's just incredible to think these guys died so young and made such an incredible impact. And the output of that each of them had was just enormous. Uh, it was the um, the amount and the high level of it. Uh, it's just just staggering. Um, I can't so. read enough about both of those. All of the great composers you'll read about their like their lives as people and how, you know Mendelssohn was also a brilliant painter. I mean the guy was so brilliant at just about everything. He was a writer and and such a speed. You know just these people are so interesting. He was a watercolorist and with of great finesse, very beautiful <laughs> uh, things. I have a collection of his paintings, and the um, Beethoven though had so much humanness about him. Uh, 
and he struggled. His life was a struggle, and in. It reminds me a little bit of Dostoevsky, um, it, because there's the Russian, one of my favorite writers, and everything that he wrote is a story of struggle, and that it, there was a kind of understood philosophy behind it that salvation comes through struggle, that and that uh, he wasn't presenting that as a as a premise of theology, but it was just sort of the philosophy behind his writing. And Beethoven um, it was a, is a testament to the triumph of the human spirit above everything that could slam against you. And I would say when, you, you, when you listen to something like the Fifth Symphony, listen for the way that before Beethoven's time, or even the generation before, his, his teacher Haydn or, or Mozart, when you listen to one of their symphonies, their symphonies are basically like, um, like a four- chapter book that has four short stories that don't intersect they may they may have keys that are complementary but there's really no recurring characters you're talking about the movements of yeah. the symphonies and yes. with with beethoven it's like a four chapter book where you have recurring characters where you have crossover between them in fact that da 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 which 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 we get in in unison at the beginning is so obvious is used in every movement in different ways and it keeps recurring because it keeps on the idea keeps coming of this the the, the power of fate maybe it is or it's the um, this kind of um, you know, maybe it's Beethoven's deafness. We, we, we still discuss what it could be, but it, it's there. It's, and it's kind it's, of it's, a light motif. Yeah, it's a negative uh, darkness of, that, that he overcomes at the end, but it's still there. Presaging Wagner. Or maybe Wagner heard that and, and Wagner loved that. Beethoven, of course. Who doesn't, um, you know, there's no yeah. one who doesn't. I wish Beethoven had written some things for organ. Uh, That's so interesting that he didn't. No. There are a couple of, there are three or four little organ trios that is, their works with one voice in the pedal, one voice in the left hand, one voice in the right hand. The contrapuntal works that were published posthumously, mm. not during his lifetime. And they're okay. One of them is quite attractive, but they're, they're in, a early, in an earlier style. They're going to be a little bit uh, more of a Baroque style. But apart from that, and he, he wrote a few pieces for a mechanical clock organ, which was an organ that played, you would wind the thing up, and it would play, uh, had little pipes, and it was like a, a clock mechanism with these little fluty pipes. And he wrote a couple of scherzos and a couple of things that are very charming, but uh, that, that was it, they're not really, but he did play the organ. And there are as many uh, records, written records of him saying, okay, he played here at this place, as did Mozart. I mean, Mozart well, played Mozart the organ everywhere. He went and played it at Abbey's Everything he took, Mozart was like the best at everything he had touched. It was yeah, stunning. Just turned to gold. Yeah. But I wish Mozart had written, I guess the closest we can get to, for my way of thinking, um, in terms of organ repertoire, would be somewhere between Cesar Franck and Charles Marie Vidor and. Um, something a little bit of German influence in there, not Liszt, uh, but something that predating, maybe a little, throw in a little Mendelssohn or something. Nothing like the Be Beethoven being the, uh, they say he was the first um, pianist whose technique was born on the piano, not harpsichord, because Mozart and Haydn were probably trained on the harpsichord. Of course. As the pianos were just being developed at their time. Yeah. Piano a forte being such a shocking thing. Mm -hmm. And then Beethoven came, by the time he came along, they were, you know, the technology of the piano was growing, developing around him. He was absorbing it and kind of seeing that the bigger sounds he could make and the, the contrast that would make him so famous in his pieces. The other thing about Beethoven that I uh, respect and I think that is so important in the whole world of music are his last string quartets, oh. which they just defy all descriptions and uh, any scholar, musical scholar, any violinist, uh, any cellist, um, anyone who listens to chamber music, when you can always stop them in their tracks by just saying the last quartet of Beethoven. Uh, you have to think he wrote nine, the nine symphonies and then he retreated from that. He retreated from large scale music makings. Down and he said, this is music for a future. 
this is not music for now, this is music for the future, because they were almost unplayable. Like Beethoven's like last, uh, it's so difficult, so demanding. And that was Beethoven's MO from the very beginning. His first piece, uh, the, the cantata for St. Joseph, the, the death of St. Joseph, even then they would say the, the, the wind parts are too difficult, maestro, the, uh, this, the string parts don't make their, and he would say he would get angry because Beethoven's like, this is what I meant, this is what I want. He goes, and of course the, the, the high Beethoven, the middle period, he was like, well, when, the, when the, the muse moves me, I don't think about your fiddle. <laughs> His music is always the hardest, and the technique evolved around his writing because they couldn't play a lot of it. Like the double bass part in Beethoven's time was almost like they could not play that; it wasn't playable. Like the technique of its time, and it had to be trained into the next generation. Well, he also made life very difficult for singers, particularly for sopranos and tenors. Uh, the ranges of which he wrote things oh. in the vocal parts of his symphonies, and then he wrote that um, cantata "Christ on the Mount of Olives," and uh, so those. Things were um, always demanding, but he wrote the way the music moved him and what he could hear. And even if he couldn't hear outside, he could hear in in the music and put it on paper. We always wonder, it. like, you know, if, if, the, if he could hear it, would the Ninth Symphony be the way it is? Because it's, you know, I, I conducted it a couple of years ago. It's just one of the most, I was exhausted after conducting this. It's really a challenge. It's long. It's mm -hmm. incredibly long. Yep. It was the longest symphony ever written at his time, of course. And, um, and he, he hybridized the cantata with the um, with the symphony, which had never been done before. And he was always breaking those boundaries. Now, I, I love to tell people the Fifth Symphony is, is, is one of the hallmarks of the, the benchmarks of uh, the symphonic repertoire because it was the first symphonic piece that included the trombones. That was the instrument of the church, but he wanted it to be so loud. Uh, he wanted the triumph of the C major, of the of the C major, to on the fourth movement to be so exciting that he added the trombones to give an extra blast, contrabassoon and piccolo, just so he had the loudest orchestra he could to kind of just blaze forth as as the C major comes victorious and triumphs over the darkness that he went through in the three movements. It's pretty exciting. I, it's going to be thrilling when we do it on July 29th next Thursday. So. Uh, tell us now what you were going to talk about uh -huh. at the beginning. Yes. So um, anyone who's watching, if uh, I'm going to give free tickets to the concert on July 29th. That's next Thursday, uh, the Great Auditorium in Ocean Grove. Uh, if you are interested in free tickets to this amazing concert, we're going to have... Uh, Gordon Turk playing a concerto by Handel. We're going to have Michelle John singing, singing, singing a Perfido, and along with um, Bianco Quack's going to play the Beethoven Romance, Opus That's 50, right. which is gorgeous and uh, just ethereal. And, you know, after the challenge we all face, the music to move the heart and soul. That's going to be next Thursday. And, and the and Symphony Number no. 5. Can't forget about that one. And so um, email me at, um, double, at musicmattersjt at gmail.com. That's again that's music matters jt at gmail.com. And the first people that email me, I'll you'll have tickets under reserve at the Great Auditorium box office when you arrive. So um how many do we have on reserve? The first ten emails I get, I'll okay, give you each two 10. tickets. So it's twenty tickets. So start putting them out there and um really excited to have you join us. It's a lovely place to hear classical music and with um it's always a privilege to make music with friends. It is. And um, every year it's a privilege. We, we get to know, we, we know each other. It's incredible. Like, you know, when you make music of someone, it's really special to, to be up there. And I can't wait to, to make that happen again. I look forward to it, too. Well, so. thank you, Dr. Gordon Turk. Thank you for the opportunity to chat again and here by the Blue Wall. And thank and you so, so much to Elias Miller for being our first super chat. We've never had a super chat before. That's a first in the history of Music Matters. So we appreciate that. And, um, Thank you so much for joining us on Music Matters. Remember, keep music alive.